village of St Faith's nestles in a wooded hollow on the north bank of the River Fawn in Hampshire, huddling round its grey Norman church as if for protection against the fays and fairies, the, the trolls and the little people who some folks suppose still linger in the, the vast empty spaces of the New Forest. Indeed, once outside the hamlet, you may walk in almost any direction for the length of a summer afternoon without seeing any sign of human habitation or catching sight of another human being. Shaggy wild ponies may stop their feeding for a moment as you pass. The, the white scuts of rabbits will vanish into their burrows. A brown viper, perhaps, will glide from your path into a, a clump of heather. And unseen birds will certainly chuckle in the bushes. But it may easily happen that for a long day, you will see nothing of your fellow man. And yet, you will not feel in the least bit lonely. In summer, at any rate, the sunlight will be gay with butterflies and the air thick with all those woodland sounds which, like the instruments of an orchestra, combine to play the great symphony of June. Winds whisper in the birches or sigh among the firs. Bees are busy in the heather and the voice of the river prattling over stony places, bubbling in pools, chuckling and gulping round corners, gives you the sense that many presences and companions are, in fact, near at hand. Now, oddly enough, although one would have thought that these cheerful influences of wholesome air and spaciousness of forest were healthful comrades for a man, no inhabitant of St Faith's will willingly venture into the forest after dark. For, in spite of the, the silence and loneliness of the hooded night, it seems that a man cannot be certain in what company he may suddenly find himself. And although it's difficult to get from these villagers any clear story of occult appearances, the feeling is widespread and such stories do exist. One such I'm going to tell you tonight. Now, the tale is in fact well known to the people of St. Faith's because they all still remember the young artist who died in the village not so very long ago. A young man of great personal beauty, they'll tell you, with something about him that made all men's faces smile and brighten when they looked upon him. His ghost, they'll also tell you, still walks by the stream and through those woods that he loved so well. And in especial, it haunts a certain house, the last one in the village, where he lived and its garden in which he died. Now, for my part, I'm inclined to think that these superstitions about the forest date chiefly from that strange and terrible event. Now, the story that I'm going to relate to you is, is based partly on the accounts of these villagers, but mainly on that of Adrian Darcy. He's a, 
a friend of mine and a friend of the man with whom these events were chiefly concerned. So, the day <clears throat> had been one of untarnished midsummer splendour, and the sun drawing near its setting, the, the glory of the evening grew every moment more crystalline. Westward from St Faith's, the beech wood, which stretches for miles towards the heathery upland beyond, had already cast its veil of shadow over the red rooftops of the village, but the spire of the church still pointed a flaming orange finger into the sky. The river Fawn lay in sheets of sky-reflected blue and wound its dreamy course round the edge of this wood where a rough two-planked bridge crossed from the bottom of the garden of the last house in the village and communicated by means of a little wicker gate with the wood itself. Now this house at the end of the village stood outside the shadow and the lawn which sloped down towards the river was still flecked with sunlight. Garden beds of dazzling colour lined its gravel walks, and the down the middle ran a, a brick pergola half hidden in clusters of rambler rose, at the bottom of which, between two pillars, was slung a hammock containing a shirt-sleeved figure. Now the house itself was low-built, and like the garden, its walls were a mass of flowering roses. A narrow stone terrace ran along the garden front, over which was stretched an awning, and on this terrace a young manservant was busy laying the table for dinner. And he was neat-handed and quick with his job, and having finished it, he went back into the house and reappeared again a few moments later with a large bath towel over his arm with which he went to the hammock on the pergola. <clears throat> it's nearly eight o'clock, sir, he said. Has Mr Darcy come yet? asked a voice from the hammock. No, sir. Well, if I'm not back when he comes, tell him I'm having a quick bathe before dinner. The servant went back into the house, and after a moment or two, Frank Halton struggled to a sitting posture and slipped out onto the grass. Now, he was a man of medium height and slender in build, but the, the supple ease and the grace of his movements from the hammock gave the impression of great physical strength. His face and hands were of a dark complexion, either from exposure to wind and sun, or, as his dark hair and eyes suggested, from some strain of southern blood. His head was small, and his face was of an exquisite beauty. The smoothness of its contour would have led you to believe that he was a, a beardless lad in his teens, and yet something, some some look which living and experience alone can give seemed to contradict that. He was dressed as became the season and wore only a shirt open at the neck and a pair of flannel trousers. His head, covered thickly with short curly hair, was bare as he strolled across the lawn to the bathing place that lay below. For a moment there was silence. Then the sound of divided waters and presently a great gasp of joy as he swam upstream, the foamed water standing in a, a frill around his neck. Then after five minutes struggle with the flood, he turned on his back, and with his arms thrown wide, he floated downstream, ripple cradled and inert. His eyes were shut, and between half-parted lips, he talked gently to himself. I am one with it, he said. The river and I... I and the river, the coolness and the splash of it is I, and the water herbs that wave in it are I also, and my strength and my limbs are not mine but the rivers. It is all one, all one dear beloved fawn. A quarter of an hour later he appeared again at the bottom of the lawn, dressed as before. He paused a moment, looking back at the stream with the smile with which men look upon the face of a dear friend, and then he turned towards the house. Simultaneously, his servant came to the door, leading onto the terrace, followed by a man who appeared to be halfway through the fourth decade of his years. Frank and he saw each other across the bushes and garden beds, and each quickening his step, they met round an angle of the garden wall. <laughs> Darcy! 
cried Frank. Oh, Darcy, I am happy to see you. But the other stared at him in amazement. Good grief, Frank! <laughs> that is the name to which I answer, but whatever's the matter? Well, sir, what have you done to yourself, Frank? You're a boy again. <laughs> I've got a lot to tell you, my friend. Lots that you will hardly believe, perhaps, but I will convince you. But he broke off suddenly and held up his hand. Ch -ch -ch. There's my nightingale. The smile of recognition and welcome with which he'd greeted his friend faded and a, a look of rapt wonder took its place. His mouth parted slightly and his eyes looked out and out till they seemed to Darcy to be focused on things beyond the vision of man. And then something obviously startled the bird and the song ceased. Lots to tell you, old man, he began again. Really, I'm, I'm delighted to see you, but you look, I don't know, rather white. <laughs> No wonder, I suppose, after all that fever. But now there's been no nonsense about this visit, all right? It's June now. You will stop here until you're fit again. Two months at least. Oh, I'm, I can hardly trespass quite to that extent, I'm afraid. Frank took his arm and walked him down the grass. Trespass now. Not a bit of that. I tell you quite openly, I will let you know when I'm bored of you. But nay, listen, come on, although we shared the studio for years, we never bored each other. But listen, anyway, it's ill talking of going away on the moment of your arrival. For now, a stroll to the river and then dinner. Darcy took out his cigarette case and, and offered it. Ah, no, 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 no. No, not for me. I, I, I suppose I did used to smoke once, didn't I? Well, you've not given up, have you? Oh, I suppose I must have. Anyhow, I, I don't do that anymore. I, I'd as soon think of eating meat. Oh, no, said Darcy. No, not another victim on the smoking altar of vegetarianism. Victim? No, my friend. Do I look like a victim? Frank paused on the margin of the stream and whistled softly, and a moorhen made its splashing flight across the river and ran up the bank. Frank took it very gently in his hands and stroked its head. And is the house among the reeds still secure? He half crooned to it. And, and is the missus quite well? And are the neighbours flourishing? <laughs> there you are. Home with you, dear boy. And he flung it into the air. <laughs> that bird's very tame, said Darcy. It is, isn't it? said Frank, following its flight. Yeah, he, such a sweet little fellow, too. Well, during dinner, Frank brought himself up to date with the achievements of his old friend, who he had not seen for six years. Years, it became clear, that had been full of incident for Darcy and plenty of success. He had made a considerable impression on of himself as a portrait painter, which bade fair to outlast the vogue of a couple of seasons, and his leisure time had been brief. And then four months previously, he'd been through a serious attack of typhoid, he explained, the result of which, as concerns my story, was that he'd come to this sequestered place to recuperate. Well, you, you've gone on absolutely splendidly, said Frank at the end. I always knew that you would. Rolling in money, I suppose. Yeah. And... Look, can I ask, Darcy, how much happiness have you had all these years? I mean, that's the only imperishable possession, my friend. And, and how much have you learned? I mean, I, I don't mean about art. He, even I could have done well in that. <laughs> done well, said Darcy. My dear fellow, I, all that I've learned in these last six years, you knew already in your cradle. You know, your pictures fetch huge prices these days. You realise that? Do you really never paint nowadays? Frank shook his head. Too busy, he said. Doing what? Now, oh, come on, please tell me. That's what everyone wants to know. Doing? <laughs> well, I suppose you would say that I do nothing. Darcy glanced up at the brilliant young face opposite him. Well, it seems to suit you, I must say. 
But no, come on, seriously. What what do you get up to here? Do, do you read? Do you, do you study? I remember you saying once that it would do all artists a world of good if we'd study one human face carefully for a year without recording a single line. Have, have you been doing that? No. No, I, I, I mean exactly what I said. I've been doing nothing. And I've never been so fully occupied. I mean, look at me. Have I not done something to myself to begin with? Well, I'm, you know, you're two years younger than me, and that makes you 35. But yeah, if I'd never met you before, I'd say you were 20. But is that really it, Frank? I mean, spending six years of your life in order to look 20, I mean, seems rather like a woman of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> First time I've been compared to that particular bird of prey. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that's not been my occupation. I mean, it's quite true that my body has become young. But much more importantly, I've become young. Darcy pushed back his chair and sat sideways to the table. That's been your occupation then, he said. Well, yes, what, what one aspect of it it has, yes. but. I mean, Darcy, just think for a moment what youth means, yeah? It, it, it's the capacity for growth, mind, spirit, body, all grow. They all get stronger. They all have a fuller, firmer life every day. Now, that is something, isn't it? I mean, most men reach their prime and remain in their prime for, what, 10 years, 20 if they're lucky. But, you see, after their prime is prime is reached, they wither. You just can't ignore the signs of age in your body, in your art, or in your mind. You know, you're less electric than you were. But I, when I reach my prime, and I'm nearing it now, well, then, my friend, you shall see. The stars had begun to appear. To the east, the horizon was growing dove-coloured with the approach of moonrise, while moths hovered over the garden beds and night tiptoed through the bushes. Suddenly, Frank rose. It's the supreme moment. Now, more than at any other time, the current of life, the eternal imperishable current, runs so close to me that I'm almost enveloped in it. Shh, shh, shh. Be silent for a moment. He advanced at the edge of the terrace and looked out, standing stretched with his arms outspread. Darcy heard him draw a long breath into his lungs and after many seconds expelled it again. Six or eight times he did this and then he turned back into the lamplight. It all sounds rather mad, I expect, doesn't it? He said. But if you want to hear the soberest truth that I've ever spoken, Darcy, and ever shall speak, I'll tell you about myself. But listen, come out into the garden if it's not too damp for you. I, I, I've never told anyone else before, but I'd like to tell you. It's long, in fact, since I've, I've even tried to classify what it is that I've learned. They wandered into the fragrant dimness of the pergola and sat down. Years ago, do you remember how I, well, you also used to talk about the decay of joy in the world? I mean, many impulses we, we settled had contributed to this decay, some of which were good in themselves, but others were absolutely not good at all. Now, among the good things, I put what we may call certain Christian virtues, you know, renunciation resignation, sympathy with suffering, the, the desire to relieve the suffering of others. But you see, out of these same good things sprang some very, very bad ones. You know, useless renunciation, asceticism for its own sake, mortification of the flesh with nothing to follow, and, and that awful, vile disease which devastated England some centuries ago, and from which by heredity of spirit we still suffer today, Puritanism. Huh? That filthy doctrine that held and taught that joy and laughter and merriment were evil. I mean, all my life, Darcy, 
I believe that we are intended to be happy, that joy is of all the gifts the most divine. And when I left London and abandoned my career, such as it was, I did so because I intended to devote my life to the cultivation of joy. Now, among people, I, I, I just didn't find it possible. There were too many distractions in towns and workrooms. There was too much suffering. So I took a step back or a step forwards, as I see it, and I went straight to nature, you know, to, to, to trees and birds, to animals, to, to all those things which quite clearly pursue one aim only, which blindly follow that single great native instinct to be happy. You know, without any thought for morality or human or divine law, I wanted to get joy firsthand and unadulterated as it scarcely exists among men. All right, said Darcy, but I mean, what is it that makes birds and animals so happy after all? Food, I'd say. Food and mating. <laughs> oh, Darcy, no, no. <laughs> Don't think that I became a sensualist. No, I, whew, I, I didn't make that mistake. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, the, the sensualist, he carries his miseries, pick a back, and round his feet is wound a shroud. No, I may be mad, but I'm not stupid. No, I went direct to nature, Darcy. I sat down here in this new forest, and I looked I mean, that was my first difficulty, of course, to, to just sit without being bored, to wait without being impatient, you know, to be receptive and alert. And it's true, for a long time, nothing particular happened. You know, the, the change was very slow. What? Nothing happened, said Darcy, with a sturdy revolt against any idea which, to the English mind, is synonymous with nonsense. I mean, what, what in the good wide world did you expect to happen? Now, Frank, as he had known him, was the most generous, but also the most quick-tempered of men. You know, his anger could flare up under almost no provocation at all, only to be quenched again under a, a gust of no less impulsive kindness. And the moment that Darcy had spoken, an apology was halfway to his tongue. But, well, there was no need for it even to have travelled that far, because Frank laughed again with gentle, kindly mirth. <laughs> I would have resented that from you years ago. Oh, and I thank goodness that that resentment is one of the things that I've got rid of. But I certainly desire that you should believe my story, Darcy. And in fact, I'm quite sure that you're going to believe it. But the fact that you at this moment should imply that you do not concerns me not at all. Your solitary life has made you inhuman said Darcy. No, human. Much more human, I should say, at least less of an ape. Anyway, that was my first quest, the deliberate and unswerving pursuit of joy, and my method, the eager contemplation of nature. Now, as far as the motive went, all right, I dare say it was purely selfish, but as far as the effect goes, oh, my friend, it, it seems to me the best thing that one can do for one's fellow creatures because happiness is more infectious than smallpox. So, as I said, I sat down and I waited. You know, I looked at happy things. I shunned the sight of anything unhappy. And by degrees, a little trickle of the happiness of this world began to, to filter into me and the trickle over time, became a flow. And now, my dear fellow, if I could divert into you one half of the torrent of joy that pours through me day and night, you would throw the world, art, everything aside. You know, when a man's body dies, it passes into trees and flowers. Well, that is what I've been trying to do with my soul before death. The servant had brought into the pergola a table with siphons and spirits and had set a lamp upon it. As Frank spoke, he, he leaned towards Darcy, who, for all his common sense, could have sworn that his companion's face shone. It was luminous in itself. His dark brown eyes glowed 
from within. The unconscious smile of a child irradiated his face. Darcy felt suddenly exhilarated. Go on, he said. I sense that you are telling me sober truth. I dare say you're mad, but I don't really see that that matters. <laughs> mad? I mean, yes. If you wish, I prefer to call it sane. I mean, nothing matters less than what anybody chooses to call things. I mean, God doesn't label his gifts. He just puts them into our hands. And so, by the continual observance and study of things that were happy, I got happiness myself. I found joy. But seeking as it, as I did from nature, I got more than I'd expected. Now, it's it's... It's not easy to explain, but I'll do my best. About three years ago, I was sitting one morning in a place, I'll, I'll show it you tomorrow, down by the riverbank. It's very green, dappled with shade and sun, and the river there passes through some little clumps of reeds. And I was sitting there doing nothing and, you know, just, just looking and listening. When I heard the sound quite distinctly of some flute like instrument playing a strange, unending melody. I, I thought at first it was some musical yokel on the highway, and I didn't pay it much attention. But before long, the, the strangeness, the beauty of the tune just impressed itself upon me. It never repeated itself. And it never came to an end, you see. Phrase after phrase ran its sweet course. It worked gradually and inevitably towards a climax. And having attained it, it went on. And on until another climax was reached and another and another. And then, with a sudden gasp of wonder, I realized where it came from. It came from the reeds. And from the sky, and from the trees, it was everywhere. It was the sound of life, Darcy. It was, as the Greeks would have said, Pan, playing on his pipes. It was the voice of nature. It was the life melody, the world melody. Darcy was too interested to interrupt, although there was a question that he wanted to ask. Well, for the moment, I... I have to tell you that I was terrified. You know, I stopped my ears and I ran from the place. And I got back to the house trembling, you know, literally in a panic. Unknowingly, I had begun, since I drew my joy from nature, to get in touch with nature. Nature, force, God, I mean, call it what you like, had drawn across my face a little gossamer web of essential life. I saw this when I emerged from my terror, and so I went very humbly back to where I'd heard the panpipes. But it was nearly six months till I heard them again. Why? said Darcy. Well, perhaps because I'd revolted. Hmm? You know, I'd, I'd rebelled. Worst of all, I'd been frightened. I, I, think, I think that's probably it. I think, you know, that just as there's nothing in the world which so injures one's body, as much as fear, so there's nothing that so much shuts up the soul. You know, I was afraid of the one thing in the world which has real existence. Is it any wonder that its manifestation was withdrawn from me? And, and after six months, after six months, one blessed morning, I heard the pipes again. And I was not afraid. And since then, oh, my friend, it, it's grown louder. It's become more constant. I hear it often now. And I can put myself into such an attitude towards nature that the pipes will almost certainly sound. And, and yet, you never yet have they played the same tune. It's always something new, something fuller, richer, more complete than before. What, what, what do you mean by, by such an attitude towards nature, said Darcy? Well, all right, I can only explain it by translating it 
into a bodily attitude. And Frank sat up quite straight for a moment in his chair, then slowly sunk back with his arms outspread and his head back. That, you know, an effortless attitude, but, but open, resting, receptive, that is what you must do with your soul. He sat up again. One word more, all right, and then I'll bore you no further. Not unless you have any questions, shall I talk about this again? You'll find me, in fact, quite sane in, in my mode of life. You know, birds and beasts, you, you will see them behaving somewhat intimately towards me, like that moorhen. But that's all. You know, I, I will walk with you, I'll ride with you, I'll play golf with you if you like, and I'll talk with any subject that you see fit. But I want to know what has happened to me. And that one thing more is going to happen. There'll be a final revelation. A complete and blinding stroke which will throw open to me once and for all the full knowledge that I am one, just as you are, with life. In, in reality, you see, there's no me there's no you, there's no it. Everything is part of the one and only thing which is life. Now, I know that this is so, but the realisation of it yet is not mine. But it will be, Darcy. And on that day, I shall see Pam. It might mean death, the death of my body, but I, I, I don't care, because it may mean immortal, eternal life. And having gained that, oh, my dear friend, I shall preach such a gospel of joy that Puritanism, the, the dismal religion of sour faces, shall vanish like a breath of smoke and disappear into the sunlit air. But first, the full knowledge must be mine. Darcy looked at him closely. You fear this moment, he said. Yes. Yes, I, you're quick to have seen that. But when it comes, I hope that I shan't be afraid. Well, said Darcy, you have <laughs> bewitched me. You extraordinary boy. <laughs> you have told me a fairy story, and I find myself saying, promise me it's true. Oh, I promise you it's true, said Frank. Well, then I know that I shan't sleep, said Darcy. Frank looked at him with a sort of mild wonder. Oh, well, what does that matter, he said. Oh, no, I can tell you, my friend, it matters. I, I'm absolutely wretched unless I sleep. Well, I can make you sleep if you want. Oh, please do. Very good. Go to bed, and I'll come upstairs in ten minutes. Well, Frank busied himself for a little after Darcy had gone, moving the table back under the awning and quenching the lamp. And then he went upstairs to Darcy's room. His guest was already in bed, but wide-eyed and wakeful. And Frank, with an amused smile of indulgence, sat down on the edge of the bed. Look at me, Darcy, he said. And Darcy looked. The birds are sleeping in the air. The winds are asleep. The sea sleeps. And the tides are but the heaving of its breast. The stars swing low, rocked in the great cradle of the heavens. He stopped, gently blew out Darcy's candle, and left him fast asleep. Now morning brought to Darcy a flood of common sense. 
as clear and crisp as the sunshine that filled his room. And as he woke, he gathered together the broken threads of the, the memories of the evening, which had ended, so he told himself, in a trick of common hypnotism. Uh, that must have that accounted for everything, he realised. The whole strange talk that he'd heard was under a spell of suggestion from the extraordinary vivid boy who had once been a man. All his own excitement, his acceptance of the incredible, had been merely the, the effect of a stronger will imposed upon his own. I mean, how strong that will was, he guessed, from his own instantaneous obedience to Frank's suggestions of sleep. And so armed with impenetrable common sense, he came down for breakfast. Frank had already begun and was consuming a large plateful of porridge with the most prosaic and healthy appetite imaginable. Sleep well? he asked. Very well, thank you, yes. Where did you learn hypnotism? <laughs> By the river. You did talk an amazing quantity of nonsense last night, you know. <laughs> Look, I remember, to, I remember to order you a daily paper. Now you can read all about money markets and politics and cricket matches. Darcy looked at him again. In the morning light, he seemed even younger and more vital than the night before. And the sight of him somehow dinted Darcy's armour of common sense. You really are the most extraordinary fellow, he said. But I have some questions. Ask away, said Frank. And for the next two days, Darcy plied his friend with countless queries, objections and criticisms of this theory of life that he'd presented until he got out of him a more or less coherent and complete account of his experience. In brief, Frank had come to believe that by lying naked, as he put it, to the force which controls the passage of the stars, the, the budding of a tree, the love of a youth and a maiden. He had succeeded in a way hitherto undreamed of in possessing himself of the essential principle of life. Day by day, he thought, he was getting nearer to and in closer union with the great power which caused life to be, the spirit of nature, the spirit of God, he said. Now, he didn't worship it, he explained. He didn't, didn't pray to it. He didn't praise it. To realise and make living to himself the fact that it was all one was his sole aim and object. And here, Darcy felt forced to put in a word of warning. Take care, he said. To see Pan meant death, did it not? Well, what does that matter, said Frank. True, the Greeks did say that, and, and they were always right. But there's another possibility, because the nearer that I get to it, the more living and vital and young I become. Well, what do you expect the final revelation will do for you? It will make me immortal. But you see, it wasn't so much from speech and argument that Darcy grew to really grasp his friend's conception as from the ordinary conduct of his life. They were passing, for instance, one morning down the village street when an old woman, very bent and decrepit, but with an extraordinarily cheerful face, hobbled out of her cottage. Frank instantly stopped when he saw her. You, my darling, how goes it all? He said. Now, she didn't answer but her dim old eyes were riveted on his face and she seemed to drink in like some thirsty creature, the beautiful radiance that shone there. Suddenly she put her two withered old hands onto his shoulders. You're just the sunshine itself, you are, she said. And he kissed her on both cheeks and passed on. But you see, scarcely a hundred yards further, a strange contradiction of such tenderness occurred. A child running along the path towards them suddenly fell on its face and set up a dismal cry of fright and pain. And at that, a look of horror entered Frank's eyes and putting his fingers to his ears, he fled at full speed down the street. Well, Darcy, having ascertained that the child was not really badly hurt, followed him in bewilderment. Are you without pity then, Frank? He asked when he caught up. No. 
But you can see, I mean, you can understand that that sort of thing, pain, anger, anything unlovely, it retards for me the coming of the great hour. Perhaps when it comes, I shall be able to piece that side of life onto the other, onto the true religion of joy. But at present, I cannot do that. But the old woman, she was ugly too, wasn't she? <laughs> no, ugly. No. She was like me, Darcy. She longed for joy. And she knew it when she saw it, the dear old darling. Later, another question suggested itself to Darcy. What about Christianity? He said. Frank shook his head. No. I just can't believe in a creed of which the central doctrine is that God, who is joy, should have had to suffer. I, perhaps it was so in some inscrutable way. I believe that it may have been so, but I don't understand how that was possible, so I leave it alone. My affair is joy. They'd come to the weir above the village, and the thunder of water was heavy in the air. Trees dipped slender trailing branches into the stream, and the meadow where they stood was starred with midsummer blossomings. Larks shot up into the crystal dome of blue, and a thousand voices of June sang around them. Frank, bareheaded with his coat slung over his arm and his shirt sleeve rolled up above the elbow, stood there like some beautiful wild animal, eyes half shut and mouth half open, drinking in the scented warmth of air. And then suddenly he flung himself face down on the grass, and lay stretched out in wide-armed ecstasy, his long fingers pressing and stroking the dewy herbs of the field. Never before had Darcy seen him so fully possessed by his idea, his caressing fingers in the grass, his, his half-buried face pressed so close to the earth, even the clothed lines of his figure were instinct with a vitality that was different from that of other men. And some faint glow from it reached Darcy himself. Some thrill, some vibration from that charged recumbent body passed to him. And for a moment, he understood, as he had not understood before, how real his friend's idea was. And suddenly, Frank half raised his head. Pipes. The pipes. Oh, they are close. They are so close. Slowly, as if a sudden movement might interrupt the melody, he raised himself and leaned on the elbow of his bent arm. His eyes opened wider. The lower lids drooped, as if he focused his eyes on something very far away. And the smile on his face broadened and quivered like sunlight on water to the exultance of his happiness was scarcely human. He remained motionless and rapt for minutes. And then the look of listening suddenly died from his face and he bowed his head sadly. Oh, that was good. How did you not hear it, Darcy? Oh, my poor fellow, how did you not hear that? Well, a week of the outdoor life did wonders in restoring to Darcy the vigour and health which his weeks of typhoid had filched from him. And as his vitality returned, he seemed to fall even more under the spell which the miracle of Frank's youth cast over him. Twenty times a day, he found him saying, it is not possible. It cannot be possible. And from the fact of his having to assure himself so frequently of this, he knew that he was struggling and arguing with a conclusion which had already taken root in his mind. July was ushered in by several days of rain, and Darcy, unwilling to risk a chill, kept to the house. But on Frank, 
this change of weather had no bearing at all. He, he spent his days exactly as he always had, under the suns of June, lying in his hammock or making rambling excursions into the forest to return in the evening, drenched and soaked, and with the same unquenchable flame of joy burning in him. Catch cold, did you say? <laughs> I've forgotten how to do it, my friend. I suppose it makes one's body more sensible to sleep out of doors. What, you mean that you slept out last night in that deluge? Where? Frank thought for a moment. Well, I, I, I was in the hammock until dawn because I remember that there was a light in the east when I woke. And, and then I went, golly, where did I go? Oh yes, to the meadow where where where, where the, you know where the, where the pipe sounded so close a week ago. You you remember when we were there? But I always have a rug if it's wet. And he went whistling upstairs. Now, somehow that little touch, his obvious effort to recall where he'd slept, brought home to Darcy the the wonderful romance of which he was still the half incredulous beholder, and the picture of other such nights rose before him of Frank sleeping under the filtered twilight of the stars, awakening at some dead hour and wandering through the hushed woods, alone with the joy and the life that suffused and enveloped him. They were in the middle of dinner that night when Darcy, who'd been unusually pensive, suddenly spoke up. I think I've got it. In fact, I've got it at last. Well done indeed, said Frank. What have you got? I've grasped the radical unsoundness of your idea. And it's this. All nature, from highest to lowest, is full. It is crammed full of suffering. You know, every living organism in nature preys on another. Yet, in your aim to get close to, you know, to, to be one with nature, you leave suffering out. You run from it. You, know, you, you refuse to even recognize it. I mean, in joy, you are supreme. I grant you that, Frank. I, I, I didn't know that a man could be so master of joy. You've learned perhaps all that nature can teach you regarding that, that, that wonderful prize. Can you not then guess what this final revelation will be? Well, it will be the revelation of horror of suffering, pain, in all its hideous forms, death. Suffering exists, Frank. You hate it and you fear it. Hold on. Frank held up his hand. Stop. Let me think. It's possible that what you suggest is true. Does the sight of Pan mean that, do you think? That nature, take it all together, does suffer to a, a hideous, inconceivable extent. Am I going to be shown all the suffering? Well, if it be so, let it be so. Because, my dear fellow, I am near now to the revelation. I'm thrillingly near. Today, the pipes have sounded almost without pause. I I've heard the rustle of him in the bushes. I've even seen, I had, yeah, today I saw the bushes pushed aside and a piece of face peered through. But I was not frightened, Darcy. At least this time I did not run away. He took a turn up to the window and back again. It's true, of course. There is suffering all through, and I have left that out of my search. Perhaps, as you say, the revelation will be just that, and in that case, it will be goodbye. But you see, I, I, I shall have gone too far along one road without having explored the other, but I can't go back now, and I wouldn't if I could. Not a step of the journey I have taken would I retrace now. In any case, whatever the revelation is, it will be God. I'm sure of that. Well, the wet weather passed, 
And with the return of the sun, Darcy once more joined Frank in long rambling days. It grew much hotter, in fact, and as it did, Frank's vitality seemed to blaze over higher. And then, as is the habit of the English weather, one evening, clouds began to bank themselves up in the west. The sun went down in a glare of coppery thunder rack, and the whole earth paused and panted for the storm. After sunset, some remote fires of lightning began to flicker on the horizon, and a low, unceasing noise of thunder was audible. But when bedtime came, the storm seemed to have moved no nearer. Weary and oppressed by the stress of the day, Darcy fell into a heavy sleep. He woke suddenly into full consciousness with an explosion of thunder in his ears. And he sat up in bed with a racing heart. For a moment, as he recovered himself from that panic land which lies between sleeping and waking, it was quiet again, except for the hissing of rain on the shrubs outside his window. And then suddenly... The silence was shattered by a scream outside in the black garden. A scream of supreme terror. Again and again it thrilled up and then a quivering, sobbing, despairing voice that Darcy knew so well spoke. My God! Oh my God! Oh Christ! Then followed a mocking, bleating laugh. And then only the rain on the shrubs. Now all that was the, the business of a moment. And without a pause to put on any clothes, Darcy was already fumbling on the door handle. Even as he opened it, he met the terror-stricken face of the manservant. Did you hear that? said Darcy. The man's face was bleached to a dull shining whiteness. Yes, sir. It was the master. They hurried out onto the terrace. The rain had momentarily let up and Darcy stumbled into the garden. Odours of rose and lily and damp earth were thick about him, but more pungent was some sharp, acrid smell that he couldn't identify. In the hazy light, he saw in Frank's hammock a gleam of white shirt as if his friend were sitting up in it. But across that, there was a dark shadow, and as he approached it, the acrid odour grew more intense. He was only a few yards away when the shadow suddenly leapt up into the air, came down with a clatter onto the path and galloped off into the bushes. Darcy could see the shirted figure was still sitting up in the hammock. For a moment, from sheer terror, he hung on his step and then the servant joined him and they walked together to the hammock. Frank, in his white shirt and flannel trousers, was sitting up with braced arms. For a second he stared at them, his face a mask of contorted terror. His upper lip was drawn back so that the gums showed, and his eyes were focused not on the two men who approached, but on something closer to him that they could not see. His nostrils flared as he panted for breath, and terror and repulsion and deadly anguish had scored lines on his cheek and forehead. Then, as they looked, his body sank backwards and the ropes of the hammock wheezed and strained. Darcy lifted him out and carried him indoors. Once he thought he detected a faint stir of the limbs. But when they got him inside and laid him down, there was no trace of life. When they lit some candles, though, they saw that the expression of terror on his face had gone. The features that they looked at now were those of a boy, tired with play, but smiling in his sleep. The eyes were closed, and the beautiful mouth lay in smiling curves, as when a few mornings ago it had quivered to the unheard melody of the pipes. And then they looked more closely at the body. Frank was, as I've said, wearing his usual white shirt as he had been at dinner. The sleeves of this were rolled up and the front was unbuttoned because of the heat. And on his arms and chest were strange discolorations. It didn't take Darcy long 
to see that these were prints caused by the stamping of some animal. They were hoof marks, pointed at the end, cloven, and of monstrous size. <laughs> 